again this uh, Wednesday night. I hope that you're having a good week and certainly grateful that here in our area we've enjoyed some warm uh, days and some sunshine, although today's been a little uh, breezy and wet. Uh, it's still good that uh, it feels like spring, even though it's a little rainy today. Uh, we're grateful, grateful that uh, the Lord is uh, blessing us with the, the, uh, the spring season, new life uh, beginning. And again, we're thankful to report that, to my knowledge, none of our church family are, have the, the virus. And so we're thankful for that. God's been good to protect us, and we're thankful for it. Good to see that our nation and states are beginning the uh, road to uh, back to, to normalcy. And we're thankful for that. Trust that uh, you're healthy. Uh, grateful to report that we have had some good news for some of our church family that are needing work. And so we trust that will continue that we'll, as our nation gets back to normal, our state gets back to normal, that these will find uh, jobs or return to their normal work schedules. Certainly that'd be, uh, we, we're praying that way and hope that, that that continues to happen. Do hold one another up in prayer. Remember also our missionaries, uh, many are uh, serving on foreign fields and dealing with the coronavirus in their, their locations. And so I continue to pray for God's uh, blessing and watch care there. Uh, grateful to hear the, of a, an answer to prayer with the Raiders in Bolivia with a need that they had. And the Lord just orchestrated and provided in an unusual way. And some of you are on his uh, uh, special uh, email list there as I am and grateful to hear that report uh, from them. I continue to pray for our missionaries around the world. Let's uh, go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Again, as I remind you, I hope that you're spending extra time in prayer during this season when most of us have extra time. And what a great opportunity for us to uh, nurture, strengthen our relationship, personal relationship with the Lord. I do hold one another up in prayer. And uh, again, thank you for tuning in tonight. Let me pray for us uh, this evening. Then Andrea and Jen are going to sing for us again. And then we'll be preaching. We're going to Nehemiah. Uh, chapter 9 again as we conclude our study of Nehemiah chapter 9 tonight on the road to revival. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, that would be, that would be fine. Let me pray and then Andrea and Jenna will sing. Our Father, we are again grateful to you uh, for your protection of our church family. Lord, uh, honestly, we're uh, grateful and somewhat surprised and thankful, Lord, for your answered prayer and protecting our church family from this virus. Well, we pray that that would continue. We thank you for your watch care over us. Lord, we pray for some family and extended uh, friends uh, or, or friends in extended regions uh, that have battled this. We pray your hand of healing upon them. Others, Lord, who have lost their lives uh, to this, we pray your, your hand of comfort and uh, blessing upon those who are bereaved. Well, we pray for our nation, both in our president and vice president, the leadership team there in the White House, as well as our state uh, leadership, our governor and the leadership team at the Capitol in Columbus. We pray you'd give uh, wisdom as we begin to open things back up uh, in our nation and in our state that, Lord, you'd protect. We pray for these states where they have already uh, opened things up, that you'd protect. We pray your protection upon our Healthcare workers, Lord, there's so many connected with our church family. We praying for them by name each day, Lord. We pray your continued hand of blessing and protection upon them. Uh, keep them safe, and Lord, at the same time, help them to be a good testimony for you in these uh, unusual, unusual days. Lord, we pray that you bless our time together in your Word tonight. We pray your continued blessings upon our church and our missionary uh, families around the world. Uh, may you be honored and glorified, and Lord, may we be strengthened uh, by your word this evening as we continue our series through Nehemiah. We thank you for it, and Lord, how that you've led and orchestrated it, uh, even for such a time of this as this that we did not see uh, coming, but Lord, you knew it would be here, and how uh, the passages we're covering are so applicable to our needs today. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to uh, examine your word and allow your word to examine our hearts and lives Help us to be wise in our response to it. Bless Andrea and Jenna now as they sing for us. Thank you for their faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Aren't you thankful that we can turn our eyes upon Jesus? He is so, so good to us and so faithful to us. We're in Nehemiah chapter 9. I want to uh, mention to you, uh, I, I'm sitting up here tonight and I had this thought, you have no idea what uh, we are all uh, dealing with, with our sense of smell. It smells like fresh paint in here. You probably can't, didn't know that, but uh, uh, obviously you do now. And so if you can recall what that sense is like, that's what it uh, is, is like here in the auditorium as uh, we continue to see uh, work being accomplished and so grateful. Brother Brian Todd has been uh, busy, busy these last few weeks in getting things accomplished uh, for us and others have been helping. Uh, Roland, of course, everybody knows that Roland has a gift of helps and he, he tends to show up and pitch in and, and he was here today. Brother Brian uh, Wharton helped some last week and others have pitched in along the way. If I left your name out, just know, uh, I hope you don't feel insulted, but grateful for those that have pitched in along the way and been able to help and a lot of progress being made here. And uh, so there's been a, a room added to the uh, choir room. We added a changing room over there. Brother Brian and uh, Brian built that out. And so uh, paintings being done, a lot of things uh, being accomplished. We're grateful uh, for those, for those that have helped in that area. Nehemiah 9, and I hope you've enjoyed our study of this chapter in particular, the book of Nehemiah. I'm, I'm a, I always enjoy whatever book of the Bible we're preaching through. I have my favorites. I'll allude to those in a few moments, but uh, this has been a good, a good series. We're not done yet, obviously, but we'll finish chapter 9 tonight, and uh, thankful for our time in, in uh, Nehemiah 9, which I, is a time of revival. Uh, we're walking with the children of Israel here on the road uh, to revival. And uh, let's go ahead and read our text for tonight. If you want to join me there, follow along there. Nehemiah chapter 9, we're, we're going to read verses 32 to 38. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep his covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies wherewith thou dost testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom and in their great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. I want to talk to you tonight about remember now. Remember now. Let's pray. Father, again, we ask your blessing on your word to each hearer. Help us to hearken to it. Give us faith to obey your word, obey your direction in our hearts and our lives this evening. Guide and direct me as I preach. Help me speak clearly and concisely, I ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Revival, of course, is a return, a renewal of Bible truth or Bible principle in our life. The people here are humbly remembering God's merciful and gracious history with them uh, as a nation throughout, throughout the ages. The road to revival, we have said, is a, is a place of sober humility separated honesty, and a stand in honor. It is a remembering of redemption, of when you came to Christ as your personal Savior. And if you have yet to come to Christ 
as your personal Savior, you need to be saved tonight. It is a remembering of God's mercy, of the victories that we've enjoyed as we follow the Lord by faith and seeing His gracious hand of fruitfulness in our life. And yes, it is even a remembrance of those hard lessons when we've gone against, disobeyed, or even traveled through seasons of rebellion. Each of us should be grateful that we can return to the Lord. We can return in repentance and be restored to a right relationship with Him again. Aren't you thankful for God's goodness? Tonight, as we conclude this chapter, we see that Israel is now recognizing uh, where they are now. They're, they're recognizing their present situation. Do you live honestly? Now, please understand, I'm not asking you if you're a, a lying cheat or a thief. That's not the question. But what I want us to examine is this. Do you live with an honest assessment of the present situation, of your present situation? Are you living honestly? We need to live with an honest view or perspective of where we are in the present. Tonight, I want us to think about now. What useful good is history or history lessons if we do not learn from our history lessons and apply them to our present. You've probably heard this statement. You Perhaps many of you have made the statement such as I have. History repeats itself. And usually what we're saying when we say history repeats itself, we're not speaking in a positive manner. We're speaking negatively. We don't learn from history, so we end up repeating the mistakes of the past. But, you know, that shouldn't be the case. We should study history to avoid those mistakes of the past. A few years ago, uh, we preached through the book of Ecclesiastes on Sunday mornings. It was one of my top three favorite series, by the way, up to present. And again, I enjoy all of the Bible, but my top three favorite books are, are Ecclesiastes, 1 John, and Joshua. But Ecclesiastes was a wonderful study. Ecclesiastes reviews and kind of does a compare and contrast of life's pursuits relative to what should be our soul's pursuit of God. Solomon, inspired by the Holy Ghost, summarizes the whole book by penning under, uh, uh, penning, uh, invert, in, uh, or pardon me, penning two specific directives in the final chapter of Ecclesiastes that should help us with our entire life's uh, process or view. In verse 13 of Ecclesiastes, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, to fear God and keep his commandments. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the bottom line. Fear God and keep his commandments. In the first verse of that chapter, Solomon says this, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember now. Remember what? Remember God. Remember your Creator. Fear God. Keep His commandments. When? Now. Now. Not someday. Uh, not uh, after I get through with this season of my life. But now. And that's where Israel is. They've gone through the history of their nation. A step by step. They've gone through the, the season of Abraham as we looked at. The, the time of of the judges, the time of Joshua preceding that, the time of their kings, the heyday of their nation, the, now the difficulties that they're facing, and they're going, this is where we are right now. Where are you? An honest assessment of the present. What good is knowing without applying? You know, the Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What good is knowing without applying? But to know and not obey is to compound the fault, compound the sin. 
I want us to see, first of all, tonight that the children of Israel, in their remembrance of now on their road to revival, first of all, had an honorable view. We see that again in verse 32. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God who keepeth covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee. They're crying out to God. They have an honorable view of God. A view of who God is. Our God. I'll not re-preach Sunday night's message. The Lord is my shepherd. But God needs to be your God. Not just God above. Not, not a, a derogatory man upstairs. He is God above. And he needs to be your God. Personal. Uh, this word for God is the Hebrew name Elohim. It's the plural name for God. One God uh, in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. He is great. He's the Ancient of Days. The everlasting God. Aren't you thankful that God is? God is. He's the Ancient of Days. He is uh, mighty, the mighty God, the all-powerful, the champion God. He's the conqueror of sin. He's the conqueror of death. God is. You know, much has changed in our world in these few months, hasn't it? Many of you, are, or a good number of you, are, are wondering what the future for your career holds. Some of you are wondering, are we ever going to get back to a what we knew as normal? Others of us, perhaps, are concerned, what, what will this nation look like in a decade from now? What kind of world are our children going to grow up in? Now, there's a lot of things that have, have changed here. It just seems like instantaneously. You know, there's one thing that has not changed. There's one person who will never change, and that is God. He's the Ancient of Days. He's the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the Champion. But listen, I want you to recognize something. The children of Israel didn't skip this. Their reference to God is terrible here was in no way derogatory. They weren't saying that God was mean. What they were saying is he is the God to be feared. Yeah. He's the God to be feared. Uh, the definition for this word terrible means uh, to fear morally, to revere. My soul, how we as a nation need to fear God again morally. Yeah. I am concerned, as are many of you who are listening tonight, that we have almost completely lost our sense of morals. I'm not the first to think of it, but I will repeat, repeat it in my own, for my own terms. You know, it might be nice if we took the same attack mode against uh, this virus, if we take that kind, same kind of attack mode against alcohol and drugs and perversion in our nation. Yeah. A lot of innocent bystanders, bystanders are, are killed or maimed, loss of a spouse or a loved one because of someone's uh, use of uh, narcotics or alcohol, secondhand smoke, my soul, I, the, the, the list would be endless. Why are these things so prevalent in our society? And it's almost accepted. We've lost a proper view of God and that he is to be feared and revered. Right. God is completely holy. He's terrible. That is a, a reverential, pro, a proper reverential fear of God. An honorable view of God. Listen, you and I are not God. And all of us would say that's right. We know that in our brain. We know the answer to the question. But an honest view of your life would say, are you living your life as if God is God or are you living your life as if you are God? That's the question. An honorable view of God. They declared uh, who their God was, who God is, and who God will be. He's the everlasting God. Aren't you thankful for that? He's eternal, immutable, absolute, unchanging, ever faithful. Is he your God? Is he your Lord? Do you have a personal relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, turn to him in repentance and faith tonight. Trust him as your personal Savior. An honorable view. Secondly, tonight, I want us to think about this. An honest view. An honest view. Notice with me verses 36 and 37. Be, again, behold, we are servants this day 
And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. An honest view, an honest assessment of the present. They honestly stated their present condition. They said, we're enslaved in our own land. Think of it. We're enslaved in our own land, the promised land that you gave to our fathers. We are producing benefits for those we serve. We are in great distress. Reminded of that famous quote, sin will always take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay. They were paying a dear price for their sin, but now they're, they're, they're in an honest assess assessment of where they are, an honest assessment of their present condition. They honestly stated this. They didn't go to the blame game, well, our forefathers did this, and they did that, and that's why I'm the way I am. That was not their attitude. Notice what it said. In verse 37, middle of the verse, because of our sins. Right. Because of our sins. Listen, uh, you may be in a difficult place because of, of some uh, sin of your forefather that set you up wherever, and there may be difficulties in your life. But listen, friend, you are personally responsible before God for your conduct. You say, well, I've got a bad attitude and I can't trust anybody because so-and-so did me wrong. Listen, friend, you've got to get over that. You can always trust the Lord. Amen. Trust Him. Your problems are your problems. I like what one evangelist friend of mine uh, said many years ago. We've often repeated it. You know, you, sometimes you just need to build a stinking bridge and get over it. Move on. You're going to sit and sulk the rest of your life? You're going to let the roots of bitterness grow up like uh, thistles in, in, your, in, your, in your heart and, and uh, you'll be prickly the rest of your life? Well, there's a thought, isn't it? I painted a picture there, one plan. There you go, you're welcome. They had an honest assessment of this was because of our sin. Personal responsibility. I remind you of where we started in this chapter. Confession begins with honesty. Confession begins with honesty. 1 John 1 9. You know that verse, don't you? All of us could probably quote it. There are about half a dozen of us here in the auditorium tonight. If I said, let's quote 1 John 1 9 together, we could do it. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, forgives our sin, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And to that we say, Amen. Praise God. We're grateful that that verse is in the Bible. Amen. We're grateful that is the truth of God's word that we can apply to our hearts and lives. But did you know something? Pardon the patronizing here. I'm setting you up. You ready? Did you know that 1 John 1, 9 follows 1 John 1, 8? Duh. I know, rhetorical question. Can you quote 1 John 1, 8? I don't know that I could. But let's consider the truth presented in 1 John 1, 8, because if you don't listen to verse 8, you don't have a proper understanding of verse 9. Honest assessment. Here we go. Verse 8 says this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, if you're not honest about the fact that you've wronged a holy God, if you're not honest about the fact that God is completely holy, just, and right, and so nation of Israel was doing, God, these judgments were right. And they're right today. God's judgments are right today. They're always right. God is always right. See, verse 9 follows verse 8. What is verse 8 all about? I'm a sinner. And then if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we're so grateful for that. I like what I'll paraphrase something that Charles Swindoll said about this text. You cannot chart a new path toward recovery and restoration without first acknowledging present reality. 
I like it. That's good. You cannot chart a new path toward recovery and restoration without first acknowledging present reality. You know, if I'm going to help someone who's in a mess and I'm trying to counsel somebody that is in a mess, the first, we've got to start with the foundation of, okay, where are we at present? If you're not going to be honest about where we are at present, I can't help you. I've tried to counsel people, and it, I, I, I almost said young people. I've tried to counsel people. And there have been times I've looked at them and said, if you're not going to be honest with me, there's no sense in us meeting. We're wasting our time here. If we're not going to be honest with God, you can't get help. You have to become clean with God. You have to be honest with Him. An honest view. Not only an honorable view of God Almighty, but an honest view of where we are in our present. That's what the nation of Israel is doing here. They're taking an honest view of their present situation. I remind you of an illustration I used last week. David. You know, David did not see restoration and recovery for himself and the nation following his horrible sin, his wicked sin. And he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then he, he, had, uh, he, set up a, he murdered her husband uh, so that he could have Bathsheba uh, as, as his wife. And uh, things were going along. And, and, you know, David did not begin to see restoration or recovery until what happened? A man of God came in and pointed his finger at David and said, Thou art the man. And what did David do? Honest view. An honest assessment of the present situation. David went, I'll paraphrase, he went, Yep, that's me. And then the road to recovery began. And that really is, friend, that is the difference between King Saul and King David. King Saul kept making excuses and blaming everyone. David said, This is on me. I want to throw myself at the mercy of God. It'd be a whole lot better for me to give myself to God and fall into his chastening than it would be the world's chastening or the devil's way. Turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. An honest view. An honorable view. Well, lastly tonight, I want us to see in verse 38, a holy vow. A holy vow. And because of all this, all this history, all that you have done for us in the past, your grace and mercy poured out and extension, extended to us, your, your uh, redemption, uh, grateful for all that you've done. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it in our princes, Levites, and priests, seal it, seal unto it. A holy vow. It was a sure commitment. They made a sure commitment. This wasn't lip service. This wasn't God, bail me out, get me out of this jam, and as soon as I kind of get things back in order, I'm going to go back to the way I was. This was a sure commitment. This was a dedication. They were claiming, and look, we're human beings. We understand that. Sometimes we make commitments to God, and we don't keep them. Listen, the answer to that, to that situation isn't, well, I shouldn't make any more commitments to God. No, well, the answer is, Lord, help me keep the commitment that I made. It is because of his grace that we're able to keep the commitment in the first place. But it's yielding ourselves to the Lord. It's yielding to him. They made a sure commitment. They wrote it down. They wrote it down. Do you write very much? Now, a lot of us whip our phones out and text people, or we fire off emails. We do some of those things. You know, a lot of this technology today has cost us in that we don't think as much as we should. We'll respond to a text quickly, you know, thumbs up or whatever, and we're all busy. I, I get it. I use thumbs up a lot. It's an easy way to respond. To, you know, got it, or yep, I'm in agreement, or whatever the case might be. We try to condense things, not to busy, take up everyone's time. But sometimes in our uh, tech-savvy time, we don't think through what we're saying or what we commit to. You know, a lot of people are afraid to make commitments to, to God or, or, or to the church because, well, you know, what if I can't keep that commitment? You know, if you took that attitude about everything in life, would you have ever accepted a job and made the commitment that you were going to do the job? Would you have ever uh, bought a home? You know, unless you're from a wealthy family, you probably had a mortgage, uh, a car, so on and so forth. We, we make uh, commitments. We commit ourselves to a lot of different things. Why are we so apprehensive about committing ourselves to what God would have us to do? They made a sure commitment. They, they wrote it down. 
They wrote it down. He was not only sure, it was sealed. It was a sealed commitment. A sure covenant and write it down and our princes, Levites and priests, seal unto it. Uh, we're we're going to indicate we mean what we say. In our time, I guess we would call it signing on the line or perhaps uh, having, it, having the contract notarized. It was sealed. Sealed. They signed on the line. What about you today? Are you living honestly? Are you living with an honorable view of God? An honest view of your present position? Listen, Art, are you a child of God? You have an honest view of your present position before God? He is God Almighty. He is everlasting. Listen, we are not. Our souls are eternal. We're creating the image of God. Your soul will spend eternity someplace. You have an honest view of your present position before God. If you don't know Christ, your personal Savior, turn to Him in repentance and faith tonight. And, oh, child of God, those of us who know Christ as our Savior, let's make sure we have an honest view of where we, we stand before God, an honest view of our present condition. Is it time for a holy vow for you? Is it time for you to have a complete rededication to God, a, a genuine I surrender all moment? We should be able to sing that song honestly. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. This pandemic season should surely be a time when our walk with the Lord has been strengthened and not strained. There's an opportunity now for more prayer, not less prayer. You say, Pastor, I think my relationship with the Lord has been strained. And I would say, okay, I can see maybe that it might be strained because you might be afraid or apprehensive to ask God questions. You know, I like what one preacher said. You know, you ought to be honest with God in your prayer because it's not like you're hiding anything from him. If you have a question about what's going on, if you have a question about what God's doing, listen, friend, ask him. Ask him reverential, reverentially. He is God, but ask him. It's not like God's trying to hold out on us. Communicate with the Lord. This should be a time of an opportunity for strengthening in our relationship with the Lord. A time of repentance, rededication, and redirection. A time to pause. I don't know what your habits are, but our family habits have tended to be over, over, over uh, these many years now that we try to take a vacation, uh, a week or two of vacation in the summer, and then we try to get away for about a week early in the summer. And usually those are uh, what we would call, especially the one at the end of the school year, which is kind of up in limbo like everything else is right now. We don't know if we're going to be able to get away or not, but uh, usually that's a time to kind of reset, kind of just pause and catch our breath a little bit, kind of find some, some uh, uh, resetting, make sure that our, 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 we, we've got our second win, our legs under us, so to speak, for the summer season, the busy summer season, and a time to make sure we're on the right path, making the adjustments that need to be made. You know, the Lord has given us a couple months here of pause. Now, I know uh, for many of us, this is a season that's been busier than ever. And I'm not discounting that for anybody that's listening who's been extra taxed. You know, working from home is not the easiest thing to do. Some of us have discovered that, haven't we? In fact, it can be a lot busier time. But it should be time for us, because we're thinking, we have to be thinking about the future and what's going on, to pause and reflect on our relationship with the Lord and make sure that we're fully dedicated to Him. Repentance, rededication, redirection. We could say it this way, confession, being honest with God. Commitment, completely dedicated to the Lord. And then change, a redirection. I'll put it this way. It is it's not so much that you need to make a redirection. It's that you need to make sure that you're allowing God to give the directions. And you're following his direction. Are you following the Lord's direction in your life? Remember now, not later, not someday, but now. Ecclesiastes 12.1, 12, 12, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. 
Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let God purify you. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Remember now. If God's spoken to your heart tonight about a specific matter, would you do business with the Lord? Would you pause now? I'm going to pray, and while I'm praying, would you communicate with God? If the Holy Spirit's pricked your heart tonight, you know what it is. Be honest with God. Let's be honest before the Lord. An honorable view of God. An honest assessment of ourselves in the present. And a holy vow, a holy commitment to God. Rededicate yourself wholly to the Lord. Remember now. Father, I pray that you would help us to apply your word according to your will and your way to our lives. Lord, if you've spoken to hearts tonight about rededication, I pray we would pause even now and rededicate ourselves to you. If it's about a specific matter, perhaps a sin in our life that you've identified and we've been fighting, Lord, help us to confess it, recognize it's sin, recognize it as sin against you, perhaps against others, and help us to confess it and ask you to cleanse us of it. And Lord, ask you to redirect our ways and change our life by your grace and mercy at work in our lives. Lord, help us to continue down this road of revival, remembering now because of all the history that you provided for us in your word. Lord, minister to needs. We give strength in the days ahead. Help us to follow you and grow in your nurture and admonition. Help us to, Lord, truly be growing in grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, before we sign off tonight, I want to give some announcements about uh, the future here, and in particular this uh, coming Sunday. We've been praying that we would be able to have uh, some type of in-person uh, service uh, beginning uh, this Sunday, and so uh, we have a plan in place here, so I want to go over, go over those uh, details. Uh, before I do that, let me remind you uh, or mention to you that our uh, the school announcements that went out this week, I know not all the church family gets those on the school uh, Facebook page, so let me mention to you that the kindergarten graduation has been canceled for our school, as well as the school awards ceremony, and the senior graduation is still going to be on that the night that it's scheduled, I don't have the date in front of me, it's a Thursday evening, I think it's the 18th, is that right, somewhere along in there, uh, of May, uh, but that will be a family-only event with the graduates, and then it will be uh, available online at 7 p.m. on that night. So that's how we're going to do uh, graduation this year, and so I wanted to give those updates to you if, you're not, if you weren't al already aware uh, of them. Now to uh, some directions here regarding uh, trying to get back to, uh, inching our way back to somewhat of normalcy here for our, our church. Uh, I've written down many things. I'm going to try to read them as much as I can so that I don't uh, get things out of order and that way there'll be uh, the least amount of confusion regarding them. We always want to make sure that we're being wise and sensible uh, and uh, we're certainly grateful the Lord has protected our church family uh, from this virus. I, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, this Sunday will be the two-month mark, hard to believe, isn't it, since we began the stay-at-home practices. So uh, we're going to begin to return to normalcy, slowly and cautiously, while utilizing good common sense and personal responsibility. All of us should understand that there are as many ideas and opinions as there are people about how we should, uh, should, what we should be doing or what we should not be doing during this season. You can, and you can also find a medical or science expert to agree with, with your idea. Well, let me mention this as well. An honest debate or an honest disagreement about how COVID-19 should be handled uh, should not be cause for disunity in the church. And I mean that. We need, we've in large part lost the ability to have an honest disagreement in our nation without coming to a point where we hate the other person's guts. 
You know, uh, we dealt with that on playgrounds in, as children in school. We're supposed to be adults. We should be able to have disagreement without uh, hating of one another, and it certainly has no place among God's people. Uh, but uh, we need to be able to have uh, work uh, honestly one with another and understand that uh, our opinion about COVID-19 or how things should be handled are not Bible doctrine necessarily, right? So let's be wise about that. Let's not allow Satan to use this to sow discord among the brethren. We should be unified. So this Sunday, we're going to have one uh, in-person service, and that will be at 9 a.m. It'll be at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, that service will then be available online for others to view who are, or are not comfortable being here. They can view it online at 11 a.m. We'll continue to have our online services of Sunday school, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night like we have been doing. So there'll be one in-person service that'll be at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Also, I want to make sure everyone understands you're not obligated to be here. I don't want you to feel that you're being pressured by me or anyone else uh, to be back in church. If you're uncomfortable coming or if you're sick, please stay home. Uh, we want you to continue to uh, join us online, and I hope that you will. There's no shame or pressure in your not being here. To those that will be attending, social distancing guidelines must be adhered to by all who are in attendance. A few directives specific about that are that, one, we must maintain six feet apart. There won't be handshaking, high five, fist bumps, or, or hugs, or any of those kind of things. We need to use extra caution that we're not congregating in smaller areas, such as the foyer, hallways, or in the restrooms. Uh, you may wear a mask if you come, if you desire to, but you should also understand that not all of us uh, will be wearing a mask. We want all our families that come to sit together. Uh, parents, you need to instruct uh, and control your children so that they're not uh, connecting uh, physically or too close to other uh, children that are here. Kind of the, the wave or, or whatever uh, will be just fine, but social uh, distancing must be adhered to. We're not going to have a nursery, so all families that come will be here in the auditorium and we'll sit uh, together. A little directive about our seating. Uh, we'll be very spread out here in the auditorium in order to maintain proper social distancing. Again, we want to be, be uh, methodical and wise about this as we can. So uh, generally how that's going to work is we'll have a, a row of aisle seating only, and then the next row will be empty, and then the, the, the row behind that will be middle only, and then aisle only, you know, we'll skip and so on and so forth. We'll have it uh, spaced out for you, uh, those that come Sunday, so it will make sense, but we'll, we'll maintain a minimum of six feet as we are uh, gathered, gathered together. So I, I look forward to uh, kind of inching our way back to the new normal beginning this Sunday. Again, I uh, hope that uh, if you're confident and, and comfortable and healthy, that you'll join us. Uh, if you are uh, concerned or apprehensive, feel don't, please don't feel pressured uh, to be here as we'll begin wisely to get back to uh, return back to what will be uh, normal, hopefully very, very soon. In the meantime, I want you to know you're loved and appreciated. And thank you again for your faithfulness to join us this evening. Have a, have a wonderful rest of the week, and uh, we'll either see you Sunday or we'll hope that you'll see us. Lord bless you.